Okay, so what will we do today? Um, I was, as I said, having a study today with the Bulgarian group around uh, some subject matter and this uh, came up. And so I shared with them some ideas and, and Priscilla had listened to it and she was like, you know, you really should share on this. Um, so I've been sitting on an understanding of something. I was kind of reserving it because we're gonna get into these uh, studies on time. Okay, there is, a, there is a time element in the Bible. Uh, the celestial bodies keep track of time. And so this, uh, this subject matter is in relation to that. Uh, I thought I would wait a little bit after, you know, uh, covering some uh, ideas before I would present this. But I think that honestly, this is a standalone presentation. Uh, it can stand uh, by itself. Uh, so that's, I'm going to do it for that very reason. Um, and, you know, we have some controversy uh, within uh, the Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement at large. Uh, there has been a contingency uh, over the past, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I heard about this even seven, eight years ago uh, when I had uh, been around feast keeping groups, this concept of Lunar Sabbath, okay? And it's gaining some more traction. Uh, the arguments uh, for it have become, I would say, better. And I'm going to give the uh, I'm going to give the logic credit, okay? Because uh, it it appears to be uh, a logic that cannot be refuted or controverted, okay? Based on uh, how it's put together. So uh, nobody has really uh, stood up and answered it in a satisfactory way. I would agree with them. It's not been answered in a satisfactory way to really say, okay, you know, 100%, you got us kind of thing. Even though uh, you could reason your way through it, but uh, they want uh, solo scriptura. They want a biblical response to what they believe is a very solid biblical uh, platform that they put together to support this concept. So what we're going to do is we're going to break it down this evening. We're going to talk a little bit about what, what, what they believe, what they're sharing, and then we're going to see if we can find a, a, a flaw in it and uh, and from the Bible, we'll see if that happens. You all will tell me if it's done or not. Um, but I do believe it'll become very clear uh, that there is a contradiction within this theory. And uh, once you find a contradiction, then then you definitely have problems, okay? Because it's either all true or it's not true, okay? That's how God works. He's either all truth. Uh, there's no uh, there's no shadow or variableness of turning in him. So it's either all light or it's not light at all. Now it may have elements of light in it. That's that's very possible. But is it truly all light? That's what we need to know. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pray and uh, and then we'll we'll do this study. So Father, I come to you in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm very grateful for uh, your love and mercy to each and every one of us and calling us for such a time as this to gather together now on the Sabbath day to open up the word, to study, and to behold wondrous things out, out of the word of God, things that maybe we have overlooked and not even seen. Even the smallest of things have significance in your word. They're not placed there by accident because this is truly is a living book. And um, so we just ask that you would just speak to us now by your spirit. You promise where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst and that you would guide us. And in essence, we do stand on holy ground as we have gathered together here, uh, and we can trust that, that uh, you will lead and guide now um, and use me as your vessel, not for any goodness that's in me, but I just desire to be a blessing. Help me to present this in a way that is very clear and very easy to see, okay, on both sides, whether people agree with this or disagree. Just let the word stand true. And we thank you for your love and mercy to us again. We pray these things in the mighty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So as I begin this evening, I would, I would like to share a quote uh, that I came across. Some people, the way they tried to use this quote, um, but let's just read it. Uh, it's in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, for Spirit of Prophecy. It's at the end of the chapter nine there in the, what will be referred to as the 1884 Great Controversy. So it's taken from page 186 of Four Spirit of Prophecy. It reads, if professed Christians would but carefully and prayerfully compare their views with the scriptures, laying aside all pride of opinion and desire for the supremacy, a flood of light would be shed upon the churches now wandering in the darkness of error. As fast as his people can bear it, 
the Lord reveals to them their errors in doctrine and their defects of character. From age to age, he has raised up men and qualified them to do a special work needed in their time. But to none of these did he commit all the light which was to be given to the world. Wisdom does not die with them. It was not the will of God that the work of reform should cease with the going out of Luther's life. It was not the will that at the death of the Wesleys, the Christian faith should become stereotyped. The work of reform is progressive. Go forward is the commandment of our great leader, forward unto victory. We shall not be accepted and honored of God in doing the same work that our fathers did. Or we shall, not, yes, we do not occupy the position which they occupied in the unfolding of truth. In order to be accepted and honored as they were, now watch this, we must improve the light which shines upon us as they improve that which shone upon them. We must do as they would have done had lived, had they lived in our day. Luther and the Wesleys were reformers in their time. It is our duty to continue the work of reform. If we neglect to heed the light, it will become darkness, and the degree of darkness will be proportionate to the light rejected. Okay, so we're, to, we're at advanced light, okay? So what we're going to talk about tonight is what some have considered an advancing of light, that, that light has advanced on the Sabbath. Okay, so we want to give that an honest look because truly light will advance according to the spirit of prophecy. Let's keep reading. He says, the prophet of God declares that in the last days, knowledge shall be increased. There are new truths to be revealed to the humble seeker. The teachings of God's word are to be freed from the errors and superstition with which they have been encumbered. Doctrines that are not sanctioned by the scriptures have been widely taught and many have honestly accepted them. But when the truth is revealed, it becomes the duty of everyone to accept it. Those who allow worldly interest, desire for popularity, or pride of opinion to separate them from the truth must render an account to God for their neglect. Okay, so this is a very serious thing that we're dealing in, okay, because um, every generation is to advance the light of God's word, okay, and we are not going to be uh, uh, viewed upon uh, by our Lord and Savior as a, a solid uh, workman in the word of God if we just rest our laurels on that which was done in the past, okay? Um, we are to be advancing truth. And so this is a principle. And if light advances, uh, then we are responsible to follow it, okay? So, so if something is true, <laughs> and even as crazy as it might seem, if it's really true, then we are to follow it. Okay, and so this is the uh, this is basically the appeal that's being put forward uh, by a group of, of brethren now that have begun to believe that the Sabbath cycle uh, is rooted in a lunar cycle and actually changes. It's called lunar Sabbath, and Sabbath can fall on different days of the week. Uh, the seven day cycle somehow has been lost um, and has been misunderstood uh, under the rubbish of men's calendars. OK, uh, there's uh, there's basically um, there are answers to all of this. OK, we're just going to deal with one small point this evening. OK, we're not it's not going to be an exhaustive study on this. It's just one problem that we can find in all of this. And then from there, we can begin to unearth others. But but the point is, is that, yes, I mean, there are aspects of these arguments that um, that, that there is there are problems with men's calendars. That is true. Um, and how do we how are we sure? Uh, that we have not lost the cycle. I mean, how do we know for a fact? I mean, how can you prove that, Bill, uh, beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt, historically, that we still today, as you would believe, as I believe, I'm keeping the Sabbath or have kept the Sabbath today. Those on this call are observing Sabbath. All right, how do we, how do we know that? Well, here's the thing, though, and I will say this in all of this. This is really a conundrum for Seventh-day Adventists, okay? Because if you hold to the position that the seventh day is the Sabbath, all right, uh, then that, uh, and, and I believe that is the truth, but let's just say it's not, okay, uh, then we would have some problems as Adventists, and I'm going to tell you why we would, and it's this quote right here that would say we have some real problems, okay, so let's read this statement by Ellen White, taken from Three Spiritual Gifts, page 90, okay, what she says about creation and the seven-day cycle, okay? I was then carried back to the creation and was shown. Okay, now at this point, for a seventh-day Adventist, like someone like me, 
okay, how I look at that. When, when she says I was shown or was shown, then this is an authoritative statement, okay? This is something that has to be true because if it's not true, then she's truly a false prophet at this point, okay? She would be a false prophet and you would have to reject her if what she's getting ready to say now is not true, okay? So she says, and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh day was just like every other week. The great God in his days of creation and day of rest measured off the first cycle as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. Now, let's, that's a mouthful right there. Let's, let's really take into account what she just said in this sentence. So she says God, the great God, okay, that being our father, I would believe, in his days of creation and day of rest, measured off the first cycle, which is that seven days, right, as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. In other words, that seven-day cycle will repeat over and over again from the first of creation all the way till time closes. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. God gives us the productions of his work at the close of each literal day. Each day was accounted to him a generation because every day he generated or produced some new portion of his work. On the seventh day of the first week, God rested from his work and then blessed the day of his rest and set it apart for the man or for the use of man. The weekly, now watch this. This is another very strong statement. The weekly cycle of seven literal days six for labor and the seventh for rest, which has been preserved and brought down through Bible history. Okay, it's been preserved. It's been brought down through Bible history. Now we're gonna to begin to prove that to be true, okay? But, but anyway, this is a statement she's making. So then she says, originated in the great facts of the first seven days. So right here in this sentence, she says that, listen, the seven day cycle has not been lost, okay? It's been brought all the way down to our time and it can be traced through biblical history, she said. Okay, we're going to see that actually uh, this evening. We're going to look at something. She goes on to say, when God spake his law with an audible voice from Sinai, he introduced the Sabbath by saying, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He then declares definitely what shall be done on the six days and what shall not be done on the seventh. He then, in giving the reason for thus observing the week, points them back to his example on the first seven days of time. Okay? So she's, again, referring back to this first week cycle. And then she goes on to say, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This reason appears beautiful and forcible when we understand the record of creation to mean literal days. The first six days of each week are given to man in which to labor, because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. The seventh day God has reserved as a day of rest in commemoration of his rest during the same period of time after he had performed the work of creation in six days. So, so in this one statement right here, we have uh, a, a what I believe is a prophet, okay, making a statement they're shown something. And what they're shown is that the seven-day cycle has never been lost. Now, there is an argument, okay, uh, that says that no, that is not the case, okay? That, that that statement right there is, is uh, maybe at one time uh, might have been acceptable because the light had not advanced, because we talked about our first statement as we opened this evening, that light would advance. Light continued to advance, and, and she was sincerely honest at that time, but, but now you know we have better information and we understand better how to reckon the calendar and things of this nature and truly know uh, this concept of a lunar cycle Sabbath is really the truth. Now, if that be the case, then, okay, and this is, is what happens in, in many instances around this topic, is that then, okay, spirit of prophecy, you got to kind of throw that out because she's false prophet. She just made a very authoritative statement there. And if that statement's not true, uh, then, then even by her own admission, okay, she would say you have to throw her out. And then at that point, you really got to have some problems with the Seventh-day Adventist church in general, uh, is observing a false Sabbath, and there's you know some speculation that that there's been some cover-ups and you know different things of this nature. I can't say you know because really I don't believe there's any cover-up because I think we're going to show uh, that there is a there's a, there is a flaw in some of this logic. Um, but but let's just deal a little bit about the logic itself of lunar Sabbath. Okay, 
where, uh, and I, I'm not going to profess to have a perfect uh, picture of it this evening. As far as that's concerned, I'm going to hit some points of, of, of tenets of, of the belief system. And, and so we can just kind of understand where it's coming from. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, so where does this all start? We're going to restore the true calendar. Okay. Now, now I believe that's important. Okay. Because the Bible does have a calendar and there is a need for a restoration of God's true calendar. All right. The, the Bible does have a particular methodology of keeping time. And honestly, we are not using that methodology today. The methodology that we're using is we're using the solar cycle. Okay. And a solar cycle is 365 days, some hours and odd minutes, okay, to make a solar year, okay? In other words, uh, because of where we are, based on a solar calendar, using a solar calendar, we can know that the spring equinox will occur no matter where you are in this world of existence that we live upon, either on March 21st or March 22nd, okay? That's just a given Okay, we know that is the spring equinox. Okay, and it's because of this spring equinox that marks the year, the new year. Okay, uh, and this goes back to pagan origins, back to Babylon, but even has uh, uh, some understanding even in the Bible because of the transition after the Exodus. Okay, of moving to a religious calendar that begins in the spring as well as a secular year beginning in the spring. Okay. Now, so there, there is some uh, valid logic, okay, to that, and that is biblical, okay? That did happen, all right? So, so why in the world, if that's the way the Bible keeps time, are we on this solar system, uh, which really is tied to Rome, okay? Well, it does make for some confusion with keeping tracks of months. It makes for some confusion with keeping tracks of years because you have to have leap year, you got to make some, you know, uh, allowances because you're gaining time over time or losing time, depending on how you're how you're 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 measuring your calendar. OK. And so there, you know, some of these arguments about that. OK, yes, I can I can say yes. I mean, I can see why they would raise concerns and rightfully so. OK. And they need to be dealt with. All right. We're not going to do that this evening. OK. But that is true. I got to give you that one. It needs to be dealt with. OK. But but where is this? begins, okay, for, and it, and it really begins for all of us as it concerns time. It goes to Genesis chapter one, okay? In Genesis chapter one, we're gonna look in verse 14, okay? And on the fourth day, okay, as we understand the days of creation, the fourth day, God does something in the heavens, okay? He places something in the firmament for a specific purpose, all right? And so we're told there in verse 14 what that purpose is. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, okay? So, so here we see that the celestial bodies, and especially if you understand some asset, aspects of creation, which I know have to be true as far as it governs the heavens, especially that these celestial bodies are circuiting overhead, okay? So the sun is circuiting at a certain speed. The moon is circuiting at a certain speed, and also these different celestial bodies called stars, some, the Greeks called them planets, okay? Uh, that's a Greek term, it's pagan, okay? The Bible calls them stars. The planets are rogue stars. They have, a, they have an interesting movement independent of the other circular motions of the other stars, celestial bodies that we see. But all of them have time elements to them, okay? That's why you can have the conjunctions of Mars and Venus, then we also have eclipses. So in essence, then we have a clock in the heavens, okay? So, so with lunar Sabbath, then the focus moves in on the moon, okay? Because the moon is a celestial timekeeper, okay? It is moving at a circuit. Now its circuit is 29 and a half days, okay? It's not 30 days as, as lunar Sabbath would say. It's not a true 30 day cycle. It's a 29 and a half day cycle. That's a little bit problematic, and we're going to deal with more of that later, okay? As we get into time studies, that will just become a natural uh, understanding that has to be problematic for Lunar Sabbath or other ideas as well. But the point is, is that yes, the moon does have a consistent cycle, all right? And so then what happens is, is then, okay, so this idea is Moed, okay? Moed or God's appointments or time appointments, all right? 
So what other moads do we have in the Bible, or at least that we can easily point to uh, later on in the uh, Old Testament is in the book of Leviticus, okay? In Leviticus chapter 23, we have these moads, okay, or time appointments that God has given to his people, okay? And so in verse one of Leviticus 23, we read, uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them concerning the feast of the Lord or moads, okay, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, and ye, these are my feasts, okay, or moads, appointments, okay. Well, then what do we see here in verse three? Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their seasons in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so the Sabbath has been lumped in with these other time appointments. And you'll notice there in verse five, it tells you how do you figure out when to keep Passover? Okay, well, Passover is basically going to be in the 14th day of the first month. Okay, but how are you going to know uh, what is the uh, the first day of the month? Well, that's where you have to understand the moon cycle and what is referred to as the new moon. Okay, because you see, when the moon is new, and that is basically when the moon is almost completely black, but has gone from you know being full down to completely black, and then begins to emerge again, where you can see light. Okay, you now have a new moon in the month. A new month has begun. And that cycle will take 29 and a half days to get to give or take a little bit. But, but overall, the course of a lunar year is 29 and a half days to get to your next new moon. And so that is marking your months. Okay. Now, this is how the ancients did it. This is how the Hebrews did it. Uh, the Ottomans did it. The Chinese and even today, quote unquote, Jews over there in Israel are doing the same. They're using a lunar calendar. Okay. Now, you need to also understand that the lunar calendar is going to be short of the solar cycle, all right? And there's ways to bring those back into alignment. Now, that's something we'll talk more about as well. I'm doing a lot of foreshadowing in this study of other. This opens up a whole realm of discussion, okay? But the point is, is that, okay, so then for lunar Sabbath, all right, what are we going to do? We're, well, we, okay, well, then if God's appointments are governed by the moon, all right, then the cycle that sets the seven day, what starts the seven day cycle should be orchestrated by the moon. And then we would count forward seven days and we get to our Sabbath. Okay, so we need to discuss one more aspect of lunar Sabbath before we can really understand the nature of this. We need to go to Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah 66, and we want to look at verses 22 and 23. Okay, this is important. Okay, because here you would appear to have a lot of proof in the Bible uh, that the moon or the new moon is uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, religious time, so to speak. So let's look at it in Isaiah 66, verse, Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. And it said, it says here, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So in the new heaven and the new earth, God will have an appointment, a moed, so to speak, from one moon, one new moon to the next new moon, flesh will come before him, the redeemed will come before him, and from one Sabbath to the next will we come before him. So, so this new moon or from one new month, okay, because the new moon marks the new month. Okay, so there they you say, okay, see, okay, so we have uh we have a precedent for what we do uh with well, well let's just look at this and we'll see, okay, because this will start to make sense now. Um as we look at this. So let's I'm gonna show you a calendar here, okay, just a standard calendar, all right. Now, we're going to learn a lot about all of this stuff. This is a slide actually from a, a study. I'm going to do another study. I'll, this slide will appear in that study. But uh, anyway, we're just going to talk about, okay, this creation week, okay? So we have technically going back to the Garden of Eden, we have a first day of creation, all right? And then we go forward seven days, we have Sabbath. Now, Lunar Sabbath has some different ideas around this. But let's just, from the traditional standpoint, we understand seven days, 
Sabbath, then another seven days Sabbath, another seven days Sabbath on the 21st and on the 28th. And then, okay, so because we are going to believe, all right, and we'll talk more about this, but let's just say our month is 30 days, okay? We have two days left over and the cycle has to reset and start over again, okay? All right, so how does a lunar Sabbatarian, how would they treat that? Well, I'm gonna call your attention to this exhibit right here, okay? This is from their teachings, okay? Um, and uh, this uh, comes from the creator's calendar, all right, so what they would say, okay, this is the first week or first month of creation, according to a lunar Sabbatarian. The very first day, right, because what we read in Isaiah 66 there is a lunar day, all right, because all flesh will come before God from one new moon to the next. So that day, in essence, is, is, is like a day of worship, okay? I don't know exactly how you would do that or how they look at that, but I just know that that is one day accounted for in the calendar. All right, now from there, then you will start counting your work days, all right? So then the second day now is your first day, and then you go forward your seven days, and your Sabbath would then have fallen in the first week or month of creation, would have fallen on the eighth day, okay? And then from there, every seven days, okay, we come to the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th. Now, to them, this cycle repeats over and over again, okay? Because it's a 30-day cycle. This 30th day here, what do we do with it? Well, there's not a whole lot you can do with it other than it that is declared a non-working day, okay? And so now you've accounted for your 30-day month, and then you will start it all over again, okay? With the new moon the next month, that day will be a moon day, okay? And you could say a celebration, day of worship, and then this cycle repeats, okay? And this is what a lunar Sabbatarian would tell you is the cycle that God instituted going all the way back into the Garden of Eden and is carried forward. Now, what happens here uh, by doing this, uh, this idea here, excuse me, uh, let's see, let me get out of here. What happens here? Um, well, we, uh, we're gonna have some confusion because Sabbath is going to fall basically uh, on any given day of a week, potentially, in any given month that you uh, would go forward in. Okay, so let me kind of give you an example of how that would look, okay, just so you can understand. So what we'll do is we'll go here uh, to a lunar calendar, okay? Now, this is a lunar calendar for April 2023, the month that we're currently in. Okay, now uh, the all black is a new moon. Okay, this is the new moon here. All right, but this is the uh, mathematical new moon. Okay, truly, we don't understand from biblical time reckoning the new moon until we actually can see light. Okay, so we would say this is our new moon here on the 22nd of April will be your new moon. All right, now, so that new moon, as we looked at our calendar here a moment ago, okay, uh, what happened? I guess I closed it out. Um, but anyway, that would be your lunar day, okay? That first day. Now, from there, you're going to count then your seven days. So first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. Just so happens in April, it, the lunar Sabbath, as they understood, is actually falling on what we understand as a seven-day Sabbath. Okay? That happens in April. So technically, if they count from here, now I don't know for sure. I know this is how I would do it, okay? As I understand how to reckon Bible time, I would count this as my new moon because I can actually see that. There's enough illumination to see it. But let's just say you don't think that's correct. Let's say you want to start it here, okay? Well, if you start it here, then this is new moon day, first day. Then you would say first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth working day, seventh day, Sabbath day, then Sabbath could be on Sunday or Saturday, just depending on how you want to count your new moon, okay, for this illustration, all right, but now let me show you, it becomes even easier to see, let's go another month forward, let's go to May, okay, and see what would happen in the month of May. In the month of May, here's our mathematical new moon, okay, here, uh, pretty hard, I'd say, to call this a new moon, it's barely any illuminated. So I'd say my new moon starts here, okay? So this is gonna be the first day of my 30-day cycle according to a, a lunar Sabbatarian. And so I'm gonna start counting here my work days. First day of work, second day of work, third day of work, fourth day of work, fifth day of work, 
sixth day of work. And now in May, my Sabbaths, okay, the Sabbaths of a lunar Sabbatarian are going to be falling on Mondays throughout the month of May, okay? And then I'm going to come to the end and I've got that 30th day. That's a non-working day. I'll start the cycle again and we could just follow this. We can go to the month of June and look at it. Okay, here is your new moon. Mathematical new moon is here. Here I'd say you probably have enough illumination to say this is your first day of the month. Okay, all right, so that's day one. Count seven working days according to Lunar Sabbath. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. Now Sabbath is falling on Tuesday in the month of June. So the point is, is that Sabbath can fall anywhere on any day of the week according to the month how you reckon it from the new moon counting forward, okay? I hope that is understandable thus far. Okay, this, is, this is their argument. Now, here's the thing. What they say then is they say, okay, look. Now, disprove to us from the Bible why we err. Now, I didn't get into the depth of their logic, okay? I just covered, I skimmed it. At best, I gave you just a really quick overview of it. But I'm going to tell you that the logic that they will run you into looks pretty good, okay? Um, and really, nobody is answering it biblically. I have to give them credit for that. Uh, they have not had anybody that will stand up and answer it biblically. Now, people will come and they'll throw up spirit of prophecy quotes or they'll try to use logic. And, and some of the logic, I think, is sound logic. But, but honestly, at the same time, is it like a sola scriptura? Did you bring a solid biblical argument to refute what we're doing here. And I have to give them credit. Uh, nobody's doing it, okay? Until today, <laughs> until today. But but it's not happening, okay? And so, you know, that's, that's fair. It should be answered with the Bible. That is a fair, uh, I have to say that is a very fair uh, uh, statement to make and request uh, to put to someone, prove from the Bible that we are wrong, okay? Now, before we do that, okay, before we get into some, some looking at a, a few scriptures here to show where we can, might have some problems, let me just share with you uh, another principle that we're really going to have to work off of here. And that is, and of course, I've been accused, you know, uh, I, I fall heavily on Mil William Miller's rules of prophetic understanding, okay, because I believe that's what makes a Seventh-day Adventist is how we study the Bible. Okay, so we have this uh, principle uh, in Miller's rules of prophetic study. Uh, it's rule number four. <clears throat> it says to understand doctrine, okay, and this lunar Sabbath is a doctrine or the Sabbath is a doctrine in general, right? It's a doctrine of understanding. It either is true or false, okay? There's true doctrine, there's false doctrine. Some people say, well, doctrine's bad. No, doctrine's not bad. Uh, doctrine is either true or false. If it's true doctrine, it's good. If it's false doctrine, yes, it would be bad at that point. But doctrine is important, okay? Because it is how we understand the Bible. Okay, so to understand doctrine, Bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. Okay, so now for the lunar Sabbatarian, they have put together quite a bit of scripture. I have to give them credit for that. They have. And, uh, and if you follow the logic of the way they put scripture together, you more than likely, if you're, you know, if you didn't know better, you're probably going to walk away a lunar Sabbatarian. Okay, it's just how it's going to work. But I mean, <laughs> that's why a lot of people are, are stepping into it and believe it's true. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. It's, it, it looks tough. Okay. But, but here's the thing, all scripture. Okay. Has all scripture been brought to bear on it? I'm going to tell you this evening, I don't see that it has. And I'm going to show you something tonight that very clearly shows that it is not all scripture being brought together on this subject matter. OK, to to then form your theory without a contradiction, because here's the thing, if it does have a contradiction. And I put it in red here, if your theory has a contradiction, it is error. Period. If a contradiction can be found in the theory, <clears throat> the theory becomes error. There's no other way around it. OK, maybe it has some truth in it. Maybe it has a lot of truth in it. OK. But still, if it has one little bit of error in it, it's tainted. And God is never tainted, okay? He's either all light or he's no light at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to look in Genesis and Exodus at something, okay? It's going to help us see, okay, has all scripture been brought to bear on this subject? 
and the scripture that we'll bring to bear this evening on it doesn't form a contradiction in the theory. And we'll look at it once we see what that would be. We'll go back and examine it again and see if it does, then Lunar Sabbath would have to be error. And that's why I can make such a bold statement on a, a post saying that we're going to show the Lunar Sabbath error this evening. That's why I can make a statement like that. All right. And I'm not going to make it without being able to back it. Okay. So what we want to do now is we want to, and I, I want everybody, if you have your Bible, I could show you the scriptures. I'm not going to do it. I want you to go see them. Okay. I want you to, to taste and touch and handle them for yourself. And if I have people on the call this evening that are of the persuasion that they believe Lunar Sabbath to be true, then please open your Bible and look at where I'm taking you to see, okay, for yourself. So in Genesis chapter six, let's go to Genesis chapter six, our first exhibit as we would look at this, okay? Genesis chapter six, and we're going to be in verse one of Genesis six. In Genesis six, verse one, we're gonna read, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So God makes a declaration here, okay? As he's seeing the wickedness increasing upon the earth, he's saying, I'm not gonna strive with flesh. They're only gonna have 120 years. Now, is he just saying that to himself or does he say that to somebody? Well, we know he tells it to Noah. Okay, that's important. Keep that in mind. God tells Noah, he tells him on a certain day. He tells Noah, look, I'm done striving with man. Noah's a prophet, right? Noah, 120 years, I'm going to deal with men. And after that, I'm not going to deal with them anymore. I'm going to destroy them from off the face of the earth by a flood. Okay, now in verse four, what does it say here? In verse four, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, which were of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart or at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Okay, so who is God telling this to? Is he just talking to himself or is he telling it to somebody? He's telling it to Noah, right? I'm going to destroy man from off the face of the earth. Okay, so now let's go to Genesis chapter seven. Because we know God has told Noah, I'm going to destroy all flesh, okay? And I'm gonna give him 120 years before I do it. Now in Genesis chapter seven, verse one, we read, and the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark, for I have seen the righteous before me in this generation. Okay, so they're called into the ark now. Now we know a little bit about this calling into the ark, right? And what happened? When they were called into the ark, the angel comes down and seals the door, all right? So let's look at this. Of every clean beast that thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So Noah, time to come in, because in seven days, I'm going to flood this world. Now, what happens in verse five? And Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Now we know how old Noah was, 600 years old when this happened. In verse seven, and Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of the clean beasts and of the beasts that are not clean and of the fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days 
that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Okay, so again, we, we get a repetition of this. Noah's in, called into the ark. Okay, then seven days later, the flood. Now, stay with me close now, starting in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. We are given a definitive date for when the flood occurred. The flood occurs in the 17th day of the second month, which would equate to uh, today as we understand our October, okay, is when the flood occurred. But that's another study, okay? Uh, they did not reckon the beginning of their year in the spring. They reckoned it at the end of September, the beginning of October. But that's, like I said, we're going to continue to unpack this. This is an intro study for some other studies we're going to do in, in many ways. Okay, but, but what we can know here is that seven days prior, which was the 10th day of the second month, Noah is entering the ark and being sealed inside of it. Seven days later on the 17th, the flood begins and then prevails for 40 days. Okay, so what does it say here then in verse 12? And rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this is where we need to pay very careful attention is in verse 13. In the self-same day, Noah entered. Entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. In the self-same day. Day. Now, what is the self-same day referring to? Well, and we're going to see this has to be very clear from the book of Exodus. That this is exactly what's happening here. Okay. And we're going to then begin to understand why self-same day is so important as we weigh in the balance lunar Sabbath or the seventh day Sabbath is who's right. Okay. On that one. Okay. But the self-same day. The same day that Noah was sealed in the ark, 120 years prior, Noah is told the flood will occur. And then seven days after that day, the flood begins. Okay? On the same day, because seven days later, in the seven-day cycle, would line it up. Now, uh, a little fun fact, and we'll be proving this in the future, that was on a Sabbath. Okay? It was on a Sabbath day the flood began. And seven days prior on the Sabbath, Noah is sealed in the ark. And 120 years prior to that, on a Sabbath day, and it is a principle that revelation is given on Sabbath. Okay, that's the that's principle. Our pioneers understood that, uh, that revelations can come to prophets. By and large, they come on the Sabbath day. So then Noah was revealed on a Sabbath day that in 120 years, I'm going to destroy all flesh from off the earth. And the self-same day, 120 years later, Noah is sealed in the ark. Okay, that's important, all right? But let's examine it now in the book of Exodus with another, quote-unquote, what is called self-same day. Now, think about it. I looked up self-same day in the Webster's Dictionary, all right? You can't find it. But when you say self-same, like, you know, if I say this is the self-same finger as this finger, Okay, it's the same finger, right? My forefinger is the same. It's a different hand, but it's the same forefinger, okay? Self-same finger, all right? Self-same day means the same day, 120 years prior. Okay, this event happened, all right? But let's look at it in Exodus, and that's going to make it even more clear. So go with me to Exodus chapter 12. Interesting enough, our answer to Lunar Sabbath is very well found in the place where the Passover is given, a moed, Okay. We find the answer to its uh, trueness or its problem, okay? But in Exodus 12, looking in verse 1, we read. We're going to read the first two verses here, then we're going to kind of skip down a little bit here. But in the first, what we see Exodus 12 is about in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, Okay. This is talking about the Passover. And after the Exodus, God did reset the calendar for the Hebrews to begin their new year in the spring, as well as their religious year in the spring, because it commemorates Passover. It's an ordinance, okay, to point them to their deliverance from Egypt. Now, it's interesting that with Lunar Sabbath, uh, there is a big uh, contingency 
uh, understanding or their argument around what happened after the exodus and then being led out into the wilderness and the manna being given for six days and the seventh day resting. And there's, there's an aspect of that that they try to use to prove, you know, that, okay, the cycle had to be reset in the wilderness and it was reset by the new moon, okay? And, you know, okay, well, here's the thing though. What if, what if the seven day cycle was already in place before they even left Egypt? Okay, what if that would be the case? Well, that is what this is going to show this evening here in Exodus, okay? We can see that that is what it will show, all right? So just keep with me here. Let's go to verse 17 now. Verse 17 of Exodus. We read here, Exodus 12. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Okay, now watch. Why? For in the selfsame day have I brought your armies of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations for an ordinance forever. Okay, so you're going to keep this Passover. Why? Because it's associated with the selfsame day. Um, just like we saw in Genesis, the selfsame day with Noah, there's a selfsame day here with the Passover. Now, what is this selfsame day about? Well, go with me to verse 40 and we'll see what it's about. In verse 40, we read, the sword, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Okay, they were captive for 430 years in verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years. So at the end of it, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. Okay, so we get a little bit more, we get another mention of this self-same day now here in Exodus. This self-same day, why are you going to observe it? Because it's the self-same day of something that happened 430 years prior. Okay, something happened. And the same day, 430 years later, they're walking out of Egypt. What is that? Let's give me the verse 48. And when the stranger shall, no, this is a little bit caveat, actually. I put this in here. And when the stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born of the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Uh, it's interesting that circumcision is mentioned in here because you couldn't keep the Passover with the children of Israel if you were not circumcised. They had to be circumcised and any stranger must be circumcised. So this maybe gives you a little bit of insight as to why they hated Paul so much when he spoke against circumcision because basically he was saying the entrance into the economy of the feast keeping system or the Moed system as the Hebrews kept it was by circumcision. Without circumcision, you could not be a participant. But that's a whole nother thing to talk about. Okay, but just something to think on. But now in verse 51, and it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. So what self same day is it? The self same day is this. The day that Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, when Abraham left Babylon, 430 years later, the children of Israel left Egypt the self-same day. Now, it can be shown uh, from a proper understanding of how to reckon time in the Bible that Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees on a Tuesday. And 430 years later on a Tuesday, the children of Israel leave Egypt, okay? After they keep the Passover. Now, here is the thing in all of this now. A self-same day. You cannot have a self-same day unless you have a consistent cycle. You have to have a cycle of consistent sevens to have a self-same day. So people try to say the Sabbath is a Jewish institution. The Sabbath is not a Jewish institution. The seven-day cycle is an institution of God that has been preserved, okay? And we're told right here in the book of Genesis that it was preserved all the way up to the flood because you couldn't have a self-same day with Noah entering the ark if the cycle had not been consistent. 
And then even after the flood, dealing with the Exodus account, which is prior to, as a lunar Sabbatarian would understand the resetting of the calendar or the resetting of the cycle, an understanding coming back to God's people out there in the wilderness, that the seven-day cycle was still running even at that time, or there could not be a self-same day when they leave 430 years after Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees in Babylon. Why do I say that? Let's look again so you can see very clearly why that has to be the case. Lunar Sabbath cannot make a reckon for self-same day. Let me show you why that can't work. Right here, let's look at their chart again. Because with the way they're working the cycle, okay, Sabbath is falling on any day of the week. The cycle is constantly being reset by the new moon. Okay, and we already saw here, <clears throat> as we looked at this, that can have some leeway depending on how you want to look at it. Okay, it could be here, it could be here. It just depends on, you know, who's deciding. Some might decide the new moon is here. Others might say the new moon's here. Some might want to say, no, we're going to go by the mathematical new moon. The point is, is that the cycle's never consistent. Okay, you don't have seven, one, a seven after a seven after a seven after a seven following each other. Okay, so with lunar Sabbath, you can never have a self same day. It's impossible. And so then, based on this principle, okay, you need to look in 2 Timothy. We go to 2 Timothy. We answer questions when the meeting is over. 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, what do we see here in the Word of God? What are we told? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works, all scripture, everything. So for a lunar Sabbatarian, you must take into account self-same day. You can't ignore it. The Bible says self-same day in two places in the book or in the beginning, in Genesis and Exodus. And you can't have a self-same day without a consistent cycle of sevens. It just will not work. And we'll continue to prove why that will be the case. But common sense just says that the way Lunar Sabbath works, you do not have a consistent cycle. Actually, what Lunar Sabbaths are doing is they're adding 12 hours every month to the calendar. Okay? Because you're saying it's 30 days long. It's 29 and a half days long. You're making it 12 hours longer every month. So in essence, then, just a little caveat in all of this, that by the time you would get to the flood date, you would add 27 years to the calendar. You added 27 years with the concept of lunar Sabbath. If truly going back to creation week, the first day was moon day, and then your work days begin to be counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you're constantly resetting. Okay, you're adding 12 hours a month. That's what's happening with Lunar Sabbath. You can just not have self-same day. I'm sorry. If you add 27 years to something, you just don't know where you are. It'd be like me saying, I've got a watch and it's five minutes fast. And I'm going to tell you what time it is two years from now with it. I'm not going to tell you what time it is because it's, there's, there's no way to tell you what time it is. It's out of sync with true time. All right. So that's the problem with self-same day is that it shows that there is not a synchronicity in time in lunar Sabbath that needs to be there if it's going to agree with the Bible concept of self-same day. All scriptures given by inspiration, okay? It's there for a reason. And if there's something that violates it, that it's a contradiction. Why do I say that? Well, if you go with me to John chapter 10, verse 35, John 10, verse 35, we read, If he called them gods, whom unto the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. And that's the principle here. Scripture cannot be broken. 
if there's something in the Bible, it has to be answered, okay? You can't ignore it, all right? So we cannot ignore self-same day. Now, here's the thing. I have asked some of the uh, new proponents of this doctrine, uh, some that are uh, very vocal right now, uh, one in particular on YouTube, um, a female. I've asked her both publicly and privately to please answer self-same day. No answer. No answer will come back. And no lunar Sabbatarian, if they're honest, can answer a self-same day with their logic because you can't have a self-same day with that logic. And so then I defer back to Miller's rule number four. I call our attention back to this rule. If your theory has a contradiction, it is error. And this evening, in a very short amount of time, we have clearly shown that there is a contradiction within Lunar Sabbath. At that point, it's error. Now, I'm not going to sit there and say to you this evening uh, that you have to believe that I'm emphatically right, okay, or that you have to believe the statement from the Spirit of Prophecy is emphatically true. Um, I do believe it is, and I believe it can be proven such. But I can say this, okay, if I'm not right, neither are you. You're not right either because your theory has a contradiction. And at that point, it doesn't pass the test of being completely true. Now, you know, are there aspects of it that have truth in them? I got to give you credit for that. They do. But that is not able to be 100% answered by the scriptures. That's the problem. Okay. And so uh, this self same day clearly shows that there is a tragic flaw in the ideas and uh, reasonings behind Lunar Sabbath. You cannot make self-same day work. You cannot have, you can never figure out the day that Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees and align it with the Exodus on the self-same day with a calendar like the Lunar Sabbatarian would use. You cannot do it in, in Genesis either with Noah. You cannot have a self-same day of Noah entering the ark and being sealed and 120 years prior being told when the flood would take place 120 years later. Just can't have it, just won't work. And so with that, I rest my case and uh, we'll, we'll close in proud. We'll open up for discussion, but I'll ask uh, that we do be respectful, okay? And that we deal with the subject at hand, okay? What we've covered this evening needs to be answered. We, if we don't want to answer that, then we will not have discussion on that. We're going to discuss what we discussed this evening uh, in dealing with it. And with that, it will be fair, okay? So I'm gonna close with prayer now. Father, again, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you so much for your love and mercy to us. I thank you that you have given us your word to lead and guide us into all truth. I thank you that uh, men spake as they were moved by your spirit, Jesus, to utter these things, and sometimes the smallest of things in your word are very, very mighty uh, when considered in the grand relation to, to a whole subject matter. So I just pray, again, that this would be clear and would help those that would, would listen to it. And um, we just thank you for your uh, leading and guiding in all these things. And we pray this in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.